Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, work with Dan Isaacson. So first I want to say this, this project has been Dan's baby for a long time. So I want to thank him for letting me work on it and letting me talk about it right now. So thank you, Dan. Okay, so this talk has two parts. Um, I'm going to talk about um, some computations in um, the R motivic atom spectral sequence. Um, and then I'm going to talk about how that relates to the Mahold invariant. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about um, computational motivic homotopy theory. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about um, the main categories. So this talk is basically all about the four following categories and um, lots of different kinds of relationships between them. So um, our categories are, so um, on the bottom right, we've got our ordinary stable homotopy category, hopefully we all know and love. Um, and over here, so we've got um, C2 equivariant genuine spectra. And on the top, I've got two different motivic categories. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page with some basic features of these categories, um, I'm going to start by uh, pointing out a few important facts. So, okay, so basically, what is motivic homotopy? Instead of working with simplicial sets, we work with simplicial K schemes, where K is some, some base scheme. We're mainly going to be working with K being either the field C or the field R. Um, so in general, um, this has the feature that there are two kinds of spheres. So there's the sphere that comes from the simplicial part in the simplicial K schemes. Um, and there's a sphere um, that comes from an actual honest to God K scheme. So there's a, um, a scheme uh, A1 minus the origin that um, works like a sphere. Um, and so every motivic sphere um, is a bunch of copies of the simplicial sphere and a bunch of copies of the geometric sphere. Um, so I want to point out the grading here. So this AB should be thought of as A is the total dimension and B is out of that dimension, how many of those come from geometry. So if we have bi-graded spheres, then we have um, bi-graded homotopy groups. Um, okay, so I think those are the main features I want to point out about um, motivic things. Um, and we've got a, a similar situation if we're working over, um, over C2. So here, um, so C2 is pretty simple as a group. Um, and so there are only two kinds, essentially two kinds of representation spheres. So you can have the trivial representation and you can have the sign representation. Um, and all uh, representation spheres can be made as a bunch of copies of the trivial sphere and a bunch of copies of the sign sphere. So again, we've got this um, grading convention where the first, the first index in this bi-graded thing is supposed to be like total dimension. Um, so again, um, we're talking about bi-graded homotopy groups here. So in C2 equivariant land, um, there are two comparison functors to um, ordinary homotopy theory. So um, you can take geometric fixed points, um, or you could just forget the action. On the motivic side, um, at least in the cases we care about, um, there's also a nice way of comparing this to stable homotopy. Um, in fact, this is sort of one of the main reasons to, to use this or to, to work with this kind of stuff um, is that the realization functors are useful. So if you're working over the field C, um, then there's a realization functor um, that is essentially just you have your scheme and then you take C points of your scheme um, and that has a topology. Um, and if instead we're working over R, you can do a similar thing. You can take C points and then realize that the thing that you've got has a Galois action. So that's why we land in um, C2 spectra. And then you can take fixed points after that. Um, so I've, I've sort of arranged these things um, this way on purpose to show that stable motivic things and genuine C2 things um, have similar kinds of structure, at least on a superficial level. Um, so it turns out that 
those things correspond in a really nice way. So this diagram here on the left, I'm going to keep going back to this. It kind of summarizes the main, um, the main relationships between these things. So for example, you know, I talked about two kinds of spheres motivically and two kinds of spheres C2 equivariantly. Um, and these things line up nicely. So if you take the geometric sphere motivically, um, that corresponds to the sign representation um, C2 equivariantly. So basically this entire talk is about um, exploiting these relationships and exploiting the fact that um, these structures correspond um, in a really nice way. Okay, so um, here is most of that previous diagram. So um, I want to show, I want to talk about um, what happens when you look at the cohomology of a point. So um, everything here is super functorial. Um, we can define cohomology, we can define eilenberg maclean spaces in a, um, in, a nice, um, in a nice way. So um, working over, working mod two, um, we've got the following relationships between um, cohomologies of a point. So I want to point out um, two, uh, two important generators here. So we've got um, rho down here on the bottom left. Um, so that can be described most simply as, so it's um, in the Hravich image, as just inclusion of fixed points of the trivial sphere into the, into the sine sphere. Um, and there's also a guy called rho um, when we're working R motivically. Um, and the point I'm making with it, this diagram is there's a good reason that I'm using the same letter for this, um, that those things correspond. So um, rho, R motivically, um, I guess there's a, there's a nice description of cohomology, motivic cohomology of a point in certain dimensions. Um, and so this is um, one of the classes that comes out naturally. Oh yeah, so I do want to point out, um, so at least C2 equivariantly, I think that rho is often called A or A sigma. Um, uh, but the point, the point is that um, motivic R cor corresponds to C2, sorry, motivic rho corresponds to C2 equivariant rho. Um, okay, so that's, that's rho. So there's one other kind of generator in this diagram that I also um, claim should be, deserves to be given all the same letter. So um, there's this there's this guy tau. So um, in uh, so say C motivically, um, this tau is only in the Hravich image um, after taking the two completion. Um, and similarly, in these other categories, um, the sense of working out better if you mod out by row on the left. Um, but these are things that sort of start in cohomology, and maybe if you're working with the atom spectral sequence or something like that, you can often see shadows of it. So that's, that's what I'm going to say about tau. Oh, and the other, the other important thing about tau, and you can even try to define it this way, is that um, square one of tau is rho. So if you like rho, then this tells you some kind of idea about what, what tau is. Um, OK, so there are two main takeaways that um, I want you to get from this picture. So if you look at the right-hand column, so we've got, um, that's supposed to represent um, realization from C-motivic stuff to classical stuff um, that's on the level of cohomology of a point, that's F2 adjoined tau going to F2. So you should sort of be thinking of like C-motivic stuff being like a deformation. Um, so that map actually sends tau to one. So maybe you should be thinking of the deformation parameter as tau minus one or something like that. Um, okay, so that's that's the that's the main takeaway for the right hand side of this. For the left hand side of this diagram, um, the takeaway is so I didn't I didn't talk about what's going on in the dot 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 in C two equivariant cohomology of a point. It's there's some more stuff. It's not incredibly complicated, um, but um, the idea is the R motivic stuff is seeing part but not all of C2 equivariant stuff. So, you know, say one reason to study R motivic homotopy or do calculations R motivically um, is that it gives you some interesting information 
about C2 equivariant stuff, um, but it's a little bit simpler and more tractable or something like that. Okay, so here we've got um, the previous two diagrams that I've talked about, so cohomology of a point, um, and we consider we can continue these relationships um, by talking about uh, dual Steenrod algebras. Um, so again, island burden plane spaces are um, things that behave well everywhere. Um, so uh, we can we've got these relationships um, going on in this diagram. So both with cohomology of a point um, and on the level of dual Steenrod algebras, the idea is supposed to be the the um, the horizontal maps are modding out by rho. So going from R to C, you're supposed to think essentially what you're doing is modding out by rho. Um, and I'll, eventually we'll see that that statement is true pretty much in the best possible way. So what can you do with cohomology of a point and the Steenrod algebra? So those are the basic building blocks for um, making an atom spectral sequence. So um, say, for example, the, the E1 page of the atom spectral sequence um, is just built out of a bunch of copies of um, this hop, hop algebra pair, um, dual Steenrod algebra and cohomology of a point. So that's what happens um, classically. And you can make the similar construction in any of these other categories. So, for example, um, working R-motivically, um, you, can, you can make the same atom spectral sequence and its E1 page um, will be a bunch of copies of this. So now it's a hop algebroid instead of a hop algebra, um, but it, it works about the same. Um, so also um, you, get, you get maps between um, these atom spectral sequences. And that's something that's going to be really important for our calculations. <clears throat> Okay, so um, a lot of the work of the project that I'm talking about um, is, or really most of the work in the project I'm talking about, is about doing explicit computations in um, the R-motivic atom spectral sequence. So again, just a final word of justification, why would you do this thing? Um, so learning as much data about, say, um, R-motivic homotopy groups of spheres um, is going to tell you something about C2 equ equivariant homotopy groups of spheres um, and other other things um, using using that that diagram that th those comparison functors. So the goal now is let's try to compute as many R motivic homotopy groups of spheres as we can using the atom spectral sequence. So the first thing to do when computing the atom spectral sequence is figure out what the E2 page is. So here, the main idea is that I claim that we already know this mod row. So remember, this these horizontal maps, you're supposed to think of as the mod out by row map. So um, in particular, we're looking at uh, the functor from R motivic stuff to C motivic stuff. Um, and once you've modded out by row, now you're in C motivic land. So in particular, on the level of Adams E2 pages, if you take um, the R-motivic Adams E2 page and you mod out by row, what you get is the C-motivic um, Adams E2 page for computing the homotopy of the C-motivic sphere. Um, so that's a spectral sequence um, that's been studied extensively by, by Dan Isaacson. Um, and so the strategy for computing the E2 page of the R-motivic atom spectral sequence for the sphere um, is to use that data about C-motivic stuff and lift it using a row box time spectral sequence. So that's, that's the strategy for the E2 page. Um, and then, of course, there's also atoms differentials. Um, so the main strategy with the atoms differentials is to use comparison, um, again, to use comparison with C motivic stuff. Um, so I'm going to talk a lot more about this comparison between R and C. So it's both sort of interesting in its own right and extremely useful for doing this computation. So here are some relationships that we've got already. 
So um, if you take the armotypic atoms E2 page for the sphere and you mod out by row, um, you get the C motivic E2 page for the sphere. Um, so better yet, um, there are maps of atom spectral sequences. So um, this uh, isomorphism um, from, uh, or rather, sorry, the map, the map from uh, the atom spectral sequence for the sphere to the atom spectral sequence um, for S mod rho, R mo typically. Um, so there's that map, and then we can continue that um, to a map. So this map on the right um, is sort of the map that's associated to this first bullet point, or sort of the map that's like better than this first bullet point. Um, so we have that that structure, um, and following through um, that isomorphism of atom spectral sequences, you end up with um, an isomorphism on the level of homotopy. And um, finally, so this is um, uh, uh, of yet unpublished work by Behrens, Isaacson, Shaw, and Chu, um, is that um, not only do we have um, an isomorphism on the level of homotopy groups between R motivic S mod rho and C motivic stable homotopy, um, this extends to an equivalence of categories. Um, between S mod row modules on the R motivic side and um, simply the so S, S modules on the C motivic side, or, or just simply the, the C motivic stable homotopy category. So um, I think this needs this needs a bit of um, I, I wrote after adding appropriate adjectives. So I think there's some technicalities there. Um, but the main the main idea is that this this mod out by row idea is is about as true as you could possibly hope it to be. Um, okay, so here's, here's going to be an illustration of one thing you can do with this idea. So um, we're going to start by looking at the long exact sequence for uh, multiplication by row. So, um, or there's a fiber sequence that's multiplication by row, um, and then we can apply our motivic homotopy. So at this point, we're all working, we're, we're still working entirely over R. Um, and so we can turn that into a long exact sequence of homotopy. Um, and then we can notice that um, the entire point of the previous slide um, is that this, this yellow term, the stuff about S mod rho, we can actually reinterpret that in terms of C motivic stuff. So in particular, say on the level of, of um, F2 vector spaces or something like that. Really what this is saying is that you can take this yellow C, C motivic um, term here and break it up as everything going on over C is either um, in the image of this blue term um, or it's detected um, by having a non-trivial image in the green term. Um, so you can actually you can actually see this very explicitly. So um, in the chart on the top right, um, so this is a picture of a particular part of um, the atom. So a particular part of um, C motivic homotopy groups of spheres. So in particular, um, it's part of the atoms E infinity page for computing C motivic homotopy groups of spheres. Um, so. Uh, what part? So I'll say more later about why why s minus w is a is a good measurement. But right now um, we're just looking at um, the the groups in in particular degrees there. Um, so first of all, so this kind of looks like um, the the atom spectral sequence um, classically. Um, so that's uh, that's not a coincidence. So um, the C motivic atom spectral sequence, especially in the beginning, looks an awful lot like the classical one. Um, there's some extra features that actually don't really appear here. Um, but the main thing is, so remember, for C motivic stuff, we're working over um, F2 adjoined tau. So there's this extra parameter tau, and in our um, usual atoms grading, multiplication by tau goes into the page. So our, our grading restriction right here is, is sort of saying like, um, we're taking a slice out of that 
um, three dimensional out of that three dimensional picture. Um, okay, so that's that's what's going on on the top. Um, so that's that's this yellow term. Um, and my goal with the slide is to tell you about um, how the stuff here breaks up um, or can be seen by our motivic homotopy in in two different ways. So first, let's look at the blue terms. So on the bottom, so here, here is a picture of the corresponding degrees in our motivic of the our motivic stable homotopy um, groups of spheres. Um, so, um, in particular, so this is it's it's the bi grading is is an atoms grading. This is part of the E infinity page of the R motivic atom spectral sequence. So this is um, the thing that we've been we've been computing in this project. Um, and so we're looking at this for the corresponding degrees. So just to orient us with this picture, um, so we've got um, rho. So rho multiplication is this red. Uh, it's it's the red lines that that point to the left. Um, and I've also got um, H1 and H0 um, multiplications marked in here. Um, so uh, the thing that I wanted to point out, so um, which elements in the blue term end up being seen in the yellow term? Well, um, it's a long exact sequence, so it's precisely the things that are not in the image of the previous term. So in other words, um, it's precisely the things that are not divisible by row. Um, so say, for example, on this bottom row, we're looking at um, this row tower, so we've got this element called tau to the fourth h3, um, and it's got uh, a bunch of multiples of rho, and then it's, it's rho torsion. Um, so tau to the fourth h3 itself is the non-rho divisible um, representative of that tower, um, and the claim is that that corresponds to something um, semotypically. So in this case, the, the names line up nicely. So tau to the fourth h3 on the bottom corresponds to tau to the fourth h3 on the top, um, and so you can see, say on the bottom, tau to the fourth h3 has those three h0 multiples, um, and that corresponds to um, the, the little h0 tower um, that you can see on the top. So, for example, you might have, before I highlighted these classes, you might have looked at tau to the fourth h3 and the bottom and thought, oh no, there are, there are four H0 multiples, this tower on the bottom is one larger than the tower on the top, but it's okay because the top guy um, over our R motivically, that one's row divisible. So that's the one thing that ends up not counting um, towards something over C. Okay, so here, that, that was an example of a, of a correspondence where the names actually lined up. So the names come from um, the, you know, the E1 page of, of the atom spectral sequence. So stuff can happen um, and the names can get messed up in this correspondence. Um, and I think it's actually pretty interesting to look at, um, you know, which, which R motivic elements correspond to which C motivic elements. So for example, I picked this page um, or these degrees in part um, because there's a, there's a good example of something that looks a little bit mysterious where the, where the names really don't line up and it's kind of surprising. So look at um, row to the sixth E0 um, over, over R. So um, this is something, so E0 was somewhere in um, the E1 page of the, the R motivic atom spectral sequence um, and it supported a differential which took with it um, a, few, a few row multiples and the thing that was left is rho to the sixth e zero, but in homotopy, um, that that element is not rho divisible. It's the start of a of a rho tower, um, and so therefore it has to correspond to something on top. And you can just sort of see the only thing we we've got in in that degree. So by the way, this is all atoms graded. So the vertical degree is atoms filtration, and the horizontal degree um, is is uh, stem. So, um, so in particular, um, it's it's S. So I guess vibrated stem is kind of weird. 
Um, so we've got in, in this degree, um, we've got three things on the bottom and three things on the top in that degree. So those things have to correspond somehow. Um, and the only way to make this work out is for rho to the sixth E zero to correspond to tau squared pH two. Um, okay, so um, I think that's all I have to say about this. Um, so that that accounted for half of the things um, in the semotypic picture. So you get the other half of the things in the semotypic picture um, by looking at um, the image in the green term. Oh, so one thing I did want to point out. So you might notice, um, so things on the bottom um, have to be in the same column, in the same stem um, as things on the top. So you can, you can read that off of the degrees in the long exact sequence on the left, um, but the atoms filtrations might not line up. Um, so for example, we've got this, um, this map comes from a map from the bottom to the top. So map of atom spectral sequences from the bottom to the top. Um, and so, um, for example, you can see here with, with, um, row to the 60 zero or a number of other classes, um, maybe the stuff down here is going to be in lower atoms filtration. Um, so the, the map of atom spectral sequences could be zero on atoms E infinity pages, like on the associated graded. Um, but it's going to do this interesting thing in homotopy. Okay, so now, now we're looking at, can we detect the other half of the, of these yellow classes by looking at their images, um, in, in the green term? So, um, so here is another part of, um, the answer for, um, our motivic homotopy groups of spheres, this time with Different dimensions or di different degrees in the in the right degrees to be to be hit by this vertical map. Um, so um, here, so we've got what what kinds of things can be hit? It's exactly um, the things whose image in the next map is zero. Um, so we're looking at row torsion things. So for example, we've got this row tower on D zero, um, and the element in that tower that corresponds to something up top. Um, is is the end of that tower. So remember, row multiplication points left. Um, so again, there's sometimes the, the names don't match up and sometimes the atoms filtrations don't match up, um, but at least in homotopy, um, you can get this correspondence. Okay, that's all, that's all I've got to say about that picture. So um, more, more generally, the point I'm trying to make is that this relationship between um, armotypic homotopy groups of spheres and semotypic homotopy groups of spheres um, is really rich and non-trivial um, and is also really useful for actually computing stuff. So I've got a few sort of sample arguments for, you know, how are ways that we can use this relationship. So the first is the most basic. So we've got a map of spectral sequences from the R atom spectral sequence to the C atom spectral sequence. Um, and sometimes you can just read off atoms differentials or almost read off atoms differentials from that. Um, so the example I've got here is that there's, so semotypically and also classically, um, there's a D3 from H0, H4 to H0, D0. Um, and if you look at what's there in the right degrees in the armotypic atom spectral sequence, um, the two possibilities um, are either H0, D0, as a target or H0, D0 plus rho times something else. Um, so basically what you know about this is that the map to C um, is, is just modding out by rho. So it sort of tells you, in, in, in some cases, it, it can tell you differentials at least up to rho multiples. So here the answer actually ends up being um, the term on the, um, the term on the right um, with, the, with the extra rho multiple. So you have to try a little bit harder to, to differentiate those two. Um, so slightly more interestingly, um, what else can we do with this relationship? So um, here's a strategy for showing hidden row multiplications in homotopy. So um, there's an example of this back here. So for example, um, this, this dotted red line down here. So I mean that that's... Um, uh, that that's a hidden row multiplication. So the class on the um, that I'm pointing at is the target of such a thing, and you can make an argument by saying, 
well, suppose it wasn't the target of a hidden row multiplication, um, then um, it would be the start of a row tower, and so therefore it would have to correspond to something up top, um, but then you would have too many things. So um, there's up top, there's one guy corresponding from the green term, and uh, and which only leaves one thing to correspond to the blue term. And if you didn't have that hidden row multiplication, um, then there would just be simply too many blue things. Um, and I don't re remember in this case whether that alone proves this or whether there's multiple choices of um, row extension. Um, but usually that, that very much narrows it down. <coughs> There's also a variant of that idea um, where you can get Adams differentials this way by saying, um, okay, so I'm looking at some page of the Adams spectral sequence and I'm concerned because I've got some element um, that looks like it's trying to be the start of a row tower. Um, and I know for degree reasons, for example, that um, it can't possibly correspond to anything over C. Um, and maybe there isn't a possibility of explaining this away with a, with a hidden row multiplication and so therefore the only way to avoid this issue is um, for it to be involved in an Adams differential somehow. So that technique ends up um, greatly shortening um, many arguments that would otherwise be kind of unpleasant with a, with, without that technique. Okay, so that's about all. So at, at the very end, I'll come back with another use um, for this idea. But for now, that's all I wanna say about this sort of mysterious and interesting map from um, our motivic, some R motivic homotopy groups of spheres to some C, um, C motivic things. Um, now I wanna look at a different part of this web of relationships of categories. Um, so um, I wanna look at, so this, uh, I guess I forgot to label it, but this, this um, vertical composition is just our realization. So it, it factors through C2 equivariant stuff. Um, and so now I'm gonna talk about um, what happens to some, so how, 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 this, how this correspondence works out. So I've rewritten that vertical chain horizontally, so I have room for more stuff on my slide. Um, so the two um, uh, most relevant comparison facts about the things in that diagram, um, are, so first off, um, here's a statement about, um, so these are uh, theorems of Douglas and Isaacson. Um, so first off, there's a, um, a statement about um, elements in the classical homotopy groups of spheres correspond to row towers are motivically um, via this realization functor. Um, and you should sort of think of this relationship as given by square zero. Um, this is, um, there's a, a much older C2 equivariant version of this fact where you replace R motivic homotopy with C2 equivariant homotopy. Um, so that's, that's a comparison for this um, entire R realization. Um, what does that do? And um, the second statement is about um, the first part of R realization. So namely the taking of the C points functor. So that's a comparison between R motivic stuff and C2 equivariant stuff. Um, and what this is saying is that in a certain range of dimensions, homotopy groups of spheres um, are actually isomorphic. So that's a strong reason to um, try to compute our motivic homotopy groups of spheres um, is that it like very directly tells you in at least some range of dimensions um, what's going on C2 equivariantly, um, which would, would have been a harder computation to get all of that. Um, okay, so I've got I've got an example. So my first example um, is the most basic thing we can talk about. So essentially what the, so the, the degrees shown are exactly the degrees are motivically that end up mapping to the zero stem in classical homotopy. Um, so you're thinking this should be boring. Um, so what have we got? So again, uh, row multiplication goes to the left. We've got H zero um, and we've got H one. Um, so illustrating these two theorems, um, so first for the, for the first theorem, um, this is saying that um, I should, my 
my row towers, my, my infinite row towers um, should correspond to um, elements in the zero stem in ordinary stable homotopy. So of course, what's going on in the zero stem in ordinary stable homotopy, it's just that tower on two, right? It's like powers of two. Um, so I should have a single infinite family of things. And so the infinite family of, of things um, in the row local R motivic world is given by the row towers on powers of H1. Um, so again, so classically two is represented by H0. That's its algebraic name. So here's an illustration of that square zero going on where I've got H2, sorry, I've got H0. Classically, um, that tower is corresponding to the H1 tower armotypically. Um, and moreover, so where is the region promised by theorem number two? Um, it's the green region that I colored in. So um, there's actually, you know, I think sometimes when you see theorems like this, you might think, oh, I bet, I bet that region is just like empty. Uh, but actually, uh, we'll see with a more interesting example coming up um, that there's actually like a fair amount of interesting stuff that's covered by that region. Okay, so here is a more interesting example. So instead of looking at the stuff R motivically um, that sits over the classical zero stem, I'm looking at the stuff R motivically that sits above the seven stem classically. So I've got a little uh, side side panel here reminding you of what's going on in um, the seven stem. So that's that sigma in homotopy names and algebra names. Um, it's H3 and it's H0 multiples. So um, looking at the first theorem, so the there are four things in that in that classical stem. So I should be able to come up with four row towers um, in this in this mess of um, R motivic data. Um, so those four towers are on the bottom. So row H4 um, supports an infinite row tower, H1, H4, H1 squared, H4, H1 cubed, H4. So again, you can see directly that there's this square zero going on. So um, square zero takes um, H3 to H4. So here we've got the classical H3 corresponding to the R motivic H4 um, and etc. Um, and also, so I've illustrated um, where, what part of this actually corresponds to um, C2 equivariant stuff. It's the green stuff that's colored in right now. So um, you've got all of the row towers. Um, you always have the row towers will show up in that region. Um, sort of the most complicated part of this picture um, over here with the hidden extensions um, does not show up um, in the C2 equivariant stuff. Um, and I think in general, the C2 equivariant part of this tends to be more regular. Um, okay, I think that's, that's all I want to say about this picture. Um, and so uh, I'm going to move on to the second part of the talk. So um, this is going to be about the Mahalod invariant and how can computations in R motivic homotopy theory um, tell you things about the Mahold invariant. So um, what is the Mahold invariant? So it's an operation with indeterminacy. So it um, takes an element in um, classical stable homotopy groups of spheres, and it spits out an element, a non-zero element in higher stem. So um, you're supposed to think that this is interesting because it's it's giving a highly non-trivial way to start with elements that we might know more about and spit out elements in sort of more complicated or more mysterious parts um, of the stable homotopy groups. Um, also, there's, um, there's, there's the idea that with some exceptions, um, this Mahold invariant is supposed to raise chromatic filtration. So, okay. How does, how does this work? So um, I've got an only very slightly incorrect um, definition. I'll have an actually correct definition on the next slide, but I thought this is too good to, to pass up that this really relates to this diagram of um, categories, sort of all of these 
um, relationships between categories that I've been emphasizing. So um, there are, remember, there are two ways to get from C2 equivariant stuff to classical stuff. You can either do the forgetful functor or you know the forget the action functor, or you can take fixed points. So the whole, what the whole invariant says is let's think about there's a way to get from the stable homotopy classical stuff on the bottom, and then you raise over the fixed points map, and then you do the forgetful map. So what's the lift? Um, so again, um, classes, uh, classical classes correspond to row towers C2 equivariantly. So this is just like the, the R motivic statement I was talking about a minute ago. So we've got um, that gives rise to sort of essentially a lift. Um, there's some indeterminacy going on with the row torsion. Um, this is where the lie comes in. You only, you only actually can get away with caring about some of this indeterminacy. Um, and then once you're here, um, then you apply uh, the forgetful map or the underlying, take the underlying space map. Um, and that can also be think, thought of as um, sending, sending row to zero. Um, okay, so here's another way of saying that. So I've got right here um, a tower of vibrations. And all of these things map to classical homotopy groups via um, the fixed points functor. So how does the Mahold invariant work? So I take some element classically, and then I lift it over um, fixed points, and I get something that might be row divisible. So here in my example, I'm imagining that the thing that I lifted it to um, is divisible by two powers of row, so that I'm able to lift two steps in the diagram, and then I apply the underlying space functor, um, and that's, that's the Mahold invariant. <coughs> So here's Dan's idea is um, let's do this same thing except um, to the part of the diagram involving um, our motivic stuff. So um, we're going to lift not just to C2, but all the way up to R um, or our motivic stuff in the same way as before. Um, so you're supposed to think of this lift as sort of like doing square zero. Um, and then you're going to do this. Um, R to C map, and then you're going to apply the um, uh, C realization to get back in um, stable homotopy. So um, here's the here's a different version of that same idea. So um, what we're saying is you take something in stable stable classical stable homotopy, um, you lift it over the fixed points functor. Um, and then you lift it further to R, and then you see how far that lifts up in the tower, um, and then and then you apply you apply a different map to to classical stuff. So the other thing I'm pointing out with this slide um, is that this relates to um, work by J D Quigley of a slightly different uh, motivic Mahold invariant. Um, so it's it's a little bit different than um, the one we've been working with because it takes as input a C motivic class instead of um, a classical class. Um, so you take a C motivic thing, you lift it to this green tower that fits in between the two towers that I've been discussing. So what is that? So that's you take um, C motivic spectra that also have a genuine C2 action. Um, and so the point is that um, the, the functor from, from R motivic stuff to C2 equivariant stuff um, factors through that. <coughs> so, um, yeah, okay, I think that's what I want to say about this slide. So here's the main question. So we have a thing that at least has the right signature to be the Mahold invariant, or at least it can be compared with the classical Mahold invariant. Um, does it does it actually compute any classical Mahold invariants, or have we just kind of defined our own thing? Um, and so the answer is, um, it recovers some interesting Mahold invariants, classical Mahold invariants, but it doesn't recover all of them. 
So with the rest of the talk, um, I've got two examples. So I've got a, um, an example of the most basic possible Mahold invariant. Um, so we can see sort of how this works when there are no complications involved. Um, and then I'm going to talk through an example of a more complicated Mahold invariant um, using, using Dan's R motivic construction. Okay, so the slogan is the default Mahold invariant is given by square zero. So how does that work in practice? So um, let's look at the Mahold invariant of two. So you start with two in classical, in the classical world, um, and what you're supposed to do is use this lift to see two equivariant stuff, um, and then see how far it lifts up the tower. So um, what does this lift over the fixed points map do? So remember, this is defined in terms of um, uh, row local stuff. So first, let's look at um, what's going on in the row local world. So um, I can take, so the, the algebra name of two is H zero. Um, so what this, what this um, lift over fixed points is doing, at least row locally, is applying square zero on the level of algebra. So H zero goes to H one in the C2 world. Um, so I'm supposed to think of that as, as like eta, um, at least in the, in the row local C2 equivariant world. Um, and then you say, well, I didn't actually want a, a class in row inverse C2 equivariant homotopy. I wanted an honest to God class in C2 equivariant homotopy. So it's sort of like asking out of that row tower, um, what's the lowest class that actually exists um, without inverting row? And so the answer here is very simple. Um, the row tower on eta, the lowest element of that that actually exists is just eta. Um, and so um, that doesn't lift up the tower at all. There's no rows in front of it. There's no funny business going on. Um, and so the next map, which is the take the underlying map, um, doesn't do anything interesting. So that's, that's sort of what happens when there's, when there's nothing interesting going on, the only thing that happens is square zero. Um, now let's look at <clears throat> now let's look at a class at, at, in a case where it's not just square zero, um, so we can see um, a few of the more interesting things that can happen. So um, we're going to compute the Mahold invariant of sigma. So its algebra name is H three, um, and this is going to be um, via the R motivic construction. Um, that I described, and um, you're going to get the same answer classically. So this um, this is not a new Mahold invariant. This is known by I think Mahold and Ravenel um, way back. Um, so the hope we're right now with the computations. Um, so this is a computation that that uses stuff in the seven stem roughly, um, and say. I've worked on up through maybe 12 stem or something like that. I think Dan has a bunch more in his closet. Um, and sort of the hope is to get to get high enough to to get new Mahold invariants. Um, but let's let's talk about this one. So we start with sigma classically. Um, so the first question is, what does um, this lift over fixed points do? So we know on the level of algebra, it's doing square zero, at least row locally. Um, so um, it takes H3 to H4. So I'm looking at something R motivically that's, that's called the class of H4. So that's not, that's not really a thing that we have a homotopy name for, so I'm just gonna call it class of H4. Um, and so now the question is, so that was, that was a row tower, um, row locally, um, but I don't, I don't want a row, I don't, I don't want a row local thing. I want the smallest, the, the lowest part of that tower that actually exists without inverting row. So that's what this question mark is. So I need to know, um, I need to look at um, our computations of um, what's actually left 
in the not row local um, R motivic atom spectral sequence and see how much of that power survives. So it turns out that H4 itself doesn't survive. So the answer isn't just simply going to be, oh, okay, H3 went to H4. The answer is H4. Um, so H4 exists row locally, um, but not so um, in the actual R motivic atom spectral sequence. So instead, um, the best thing we've got is rho H4. So H4 supported the differential. Um, so we've got rho H4 that's left. So that's what this picture is illustrating. Um, so I can fill in the, the question mark with um, what, is, what is an honest to God um, R motivic class um, rho H4. Okay, so that's, that's half, of, half of this. Um, for the other half of the question, we need to see what happens um, when I take my thing back down to classical, classical homotopy. So in particular, this uh, map that I've got highlighted in gray, um, that can be thought of as a composition of two things. So first we have to apply this um, sort of sometimes mysterious R to C map. Um, and then after that, we have to apply um, C realization. So C realization is, is easy to describe in terms of names, names of elements. It just takes count of one. Um, but so first, so, so the main thing is we have to, we have to think about what that R to C map does. So here I've got um, the picture from earlier that's supposed to help me um, think about what the R to C map does. So I've got my class rho H4. Um, so the whole point is that that's not rho divisible. Um, otherwise, I would have taken H4. So I've got the start of a rho tower. Um, and so it needs to correspond to something um, C-motivically. So just from this picture alone, you can't tell whether it's tau H3 squared or tau D0. Um, but you can, you can tell by looking at the green half of this um, that it has to be tau H3 squared. So that correspondence is telling me that um, the appropriate C-motivic class is tau H3 squared. And so now I do the easy part. I invert tau. And so what I end up with is H3 squared. Or rather, that's the algebra name. Um, and the homotopy name for that is sigma squared. So all of this um, was a proof that, well, at least the R motivic um, the whole invariant of sigma is sigma squared. Um, in this case, that actually agrees with the, with the classical one. Um, so I do want to mention, so what are, um, what are some ways this can go wrong? So um, Dan and I are sort of still thinking about that a bit, but um, uh, one simple way for this to go wrong is um, the machinery guarantees, say, we're going to have something non-zero in, say, the, the row H4 slot. But for all we know, that could go to a tau torsion class um, in this, in this blue-green correspondence thing. Um, so if, say, tau H3 squared happens to not be tau torsion semotypically, and we know that, um, but if it happened to be tau torsion, then um, this map would have taken it to zero. So it's possible that this R motivic Mahold invariant um, uh, can be zero. And the whole point of the classical Mahold invariant is that it's never zero. So that's one way in which, um, in which these might not agree. Okay, so I think, I think that's, yep, that's all I've got. Okay. And then I'm going to go ahead and mute everyone again for one second so to cut down on the background noise. And then we'll open it up for questions. Well, I have one question. This is kind of specific. Can you go back to slide nine? Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, no, I want to go back. I want to look at the S minus W equals seven. Another, mm -hmm. I need a different, yeah. Oh. So, yeah, there, that one. You were talking about this filtration shifts in the row to the sixth, the zero, this filtration shift to the top picture. 
but I real but it looks like in the seven stem where you have those two dots, those two highlighted dots in filtration three, there's also some kind of weird filtration shift there also, right? Because there's a th um sorry, which which stem are you looking at? The seven stem. Uh no, nine stem. Sorry, nine stem. Three, four, six, eight, nine. Um Tau the where one's labeled Tau the fourth H two cubed. Yeah, so there I guess two, two classes of filtration. Both increase Adam's filtration. And then above there's one and three and one and four. So there's some kind of like basis you have to choose to see which one is a filtration shift. Anyway, I'm just observing that Yeah. That that, that might need a bit more thought. I know that I know that these two things have to correspond with yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, like exactly which vector like space representatives of the two things up here correspond to the two things up there. Okay. Other questions? Okay. I'm going to unmute everyone one more time, and we'll thank you again. Okay. And we will meet again in two weeks. Okay. Thanks, everyone.